Welcome to the Her Vibe is Pretty podcast, where you'll be guided on how to step up into your evolved woman, design your dream life, and start living it. Let's get vibey. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Her Vibe is Pretty podcast. So today you have another solo episode with me, Mary, and today's episode is actually part two of the pregnancy Q&A. So you guys asked me so many incredible questions about pregnancy and fears and yoga and movement and body image and so many fun general questions and delivery and birth plan and baby stuff. And I was not able to get to all of the questions in the first episode. So decided to instead break it into two parts. So if you haven't already listened to part one, in that episode, I cover a lot of the kind of general questions about pregnancy. I talk a lot about movement and yoga and prenatal yoga throughout your pregnancy, like how it looks in your first and second and third trimester. And again, I give you more of my personal experience because it's so different for everyone. And then to wrap that episode up, we talked about body image because this is, in my opinion, a huge, huge thing and can potentially be a dangerous thing when it comes to our mindset during pregnancy and the things that we get caught up on. So I share a lot of my honest feelings there. Um, And so this episode, we are going to be talking about more of the deep stuff. So we're going to be diving into the fears around pregnancy. There are a lot (laughs) and a lot of different really good questions that you guys asked here, as well as talking about delivery and overcoming the fears around birth and delivery and my birth plan and then baby stuff in general, um, becoming a parent, all that sort of thing. So let's just dive right into some of these questions. So the first question is, are you nervous about being a first-time mom? And the answer to that is, heck yes. There are a lot of nerves around becoming a mother for the first time. And obviously, I've never done this before. I don't have a ton of experience with children. So I feel like I'm stepping into this completely new role. And it's probably the most important role I will ever have in my entire life. But what I keep telling myself and how I've been able to kind of work through the nerves and any you know real stress or anxiety around becoming a mother is just reminding myself that this is something that I care for so much and that I'm going to do the very, very best that I can. I am going to educate myself in ways also realizing that not every child is the same. So some of the rules might not apply to my child and my situation, and that's okay. I am also a huge believer in motherly instincts. So I feel like sitting here now before the baby's actually here and trying to figure out all of these parenting things ahead of time isn't really doing myself any good, where I feel like when I'm in the moment, I will have a gut feeling or a gut instinct on how I should be handling the situation. I also know that I have a really solid support team around me, including my husband and my other mama friends and my own mom and my mother-in-law to help be guides for me when I do feel stuck or when I do feel like I'm not sure how I should move forward. Um, I also talked a little bit about in part one, uh, Carrie Locker, who is a postpartum nurse and I've taken her newborn course and I also have her breastfeeding one too. She has a really great online community that I think is going to be a great resource for me becoming a new mom. And again, it's like one of those things where everyone has their own opinion and everyone has their way of doing things. And so I need to go into this situation realizing that some of the things might make a lot of sense for me and might be very helpful and some of them might not be, and that's okay. You know, sometimes I might have to pave my own path as a parent and I'm cool with that. So yeah, I'm definitely nervous about being a first time mom. However, I really do trust that because I care about it so much and because it's something that I you know, want to do my very best at that even if I make mistakes, everything will be okay. Like everything will buff out. (laughs) 
<laughs> Were you ever apprehensive about what your about what pregnancy and motherhood could do to your yoga practice and your teaching. And I'm also going to add in like business. So I don't know if they were including that or referring to that, but 100% yes. It was definitely one of those things that I was very hesitant about because I knew that as soon as I stepped into that role of, you know, parenthood and becoming a mother, that was going to become my first priority where in my everyday life, you know, my business is one of my top priorities. And of course, I still care so much about my business and my yoga practice and being a yoga teacher. And now that I'm like getting towards the end of pregnancy, I've seen how I've been able to blend the two in a really beautiful way. And so I'm I was really apprehensive about it on the front end, but I've also realized now that I've gone through pregnancy for the most part, um, and as I kind of transition into this motherhood realm, that you can 100% do both. You can kick ass at doing both, and I plan on really owning that. I think there will definitely be a bit of a adjustment period there because I'm going to be learning how to be a mom for the first time. And that's going to take a lot of time and energy and all the things, which will then take me probably away from some of my own personal practices for a period of time. But I definitely feel like I'll be able to get to a good place where I can continue to manage both really well. But it definitely scares me. I mean, my business and my yoga practice and being a yoga teacher are like the major things in my life so far. And so to add this new thing, like one of the sayings that Sarah and I have um, is that babies bring abundance. And so that's been one of my mantras lately that when I catch myself being nervous about like, what if people aren't interested in me once I'm a mom or like aren't interested in like my life now that I'm a mother and sharing like that side of my life as well. I just keep reminding myself babies bring abundance. And I know that anyone that is not interested in following that journey, there's going to be so many other people that are interested in following it. And I want to focus on those people in continuing to serve that group. But the other thing is like, even though I'm adding this new addition to my life of having a baby, I'm still me. Yoga is still a huge part of my life. And yeah, it might look a little bit different than it did before, but that's okay because change is inevitable. Change is one of those things that we're always dealing with in one way or another. Um, So I'm really looking forward to see how things start to play out, but I definitely won't lie. There was nervousness and worries on the front end, but I've sort of eased them throughout as I've seen just like how it's played out throughout pregnancy and it'll probably be the same during motherhood. What is your biggest motherhood and post-pregnancy scare? Oh my goodness. So not to be like too morbid, but one of the things that I'm definitely worried about or have been a little bit worried about is just the health of the baby being born, especially having gestational diabetes as a complication just adds in extra risk. And in pregnancy is already scary enough. So to have like this extra layer of things that like could go wrong or statistically I'm more likely to get because I'm diabetic is scary. Um, and so that's kind of my biggest fear, um, as well as just like the safety of the child, kind of like the unknowns of like, am I going to be a good mom? Like how, what's the baby going to be like? What's being sleep deprived going to be like? What's my relationship with Jake going to be like? How is that going to shift and change? You know, there's a lot of things that people tell you like, oh my gosh, your life's going to be so different. And as much as I love to embrace the change that's going to happen, I also want to make sure that we try to keep the changes as positive as possible and are just really proactive about anything. So like if, you know, I'm feeling really frustrated because, you know, I'm sleep deprived and I just feel like a dirty slob because I like haven't showered or washed my hair in forever. And, you know, I'm getting angry and snapping at Jake 
And, you know, he's getting mad at me because he's sleep deprived too. And he's, you know, working full time and then coming home to just, you know, crazy house with crazy baby. It's like, I want to make sure that we talk about as many things on the front end. And we have been having some really good conversations about, you know, responsibilities and expectations and like, you know, what things are going to change and and how long we kind of want them to change for, you know, he's really active. Like he plays hockey and he plays golf and it's like, I want him to still be able to enjoy some of his activities. But on the other hand, it's like, I also don't want to be stuck with the baby the whole time and just, you know, playing mom the whole time by myself. So, you know, these are conversations that we've been having on the front end. And I'm really grateful for a lot of my other mama friends who've kind of given me these heads up, like, hey, these are really good things that you should talk about ahead of time instead of in the heat of the moment when things are going down um, and everyone's frustrated and sleep deprived and all the things. Um, So those are a couple of things that I'm a little bit nervous about. Um, But again, at the end of the day, I'm really just trying to surrender and trust knowing that like health of the baby wise, like I've done everything I can to be as healthy during this pregnancy. I've done and signed up for like the extra testing that they've recommended just to make sure everything's going smooth and going well. Everything has been going great so far. But again, you just never know. You know, it's there's a lot of unknown around there and it can be really hard to surrender to that, especially around something that you care about so much. Um, so yeah, and then I also think, again, it's really helpful to have some of those conversations with your significant other ahead of time, um, just so that when you are, you know, just like spread so thin and your hormones are fluctuating like crazy and you're not feeling like yourself, that that's not the time that you're having these difficult conversations, but instead having them ahead of time. So we've been trying to do that, but again, you know, we've never done this before. So I'm sure there's things that we don't even realize that we should be chatting about, but you know, we both care. We both love each other and we're going to do our best. All right, next question. These are so good, you guys. How did you overcome the fear of birth? I have so much anxiety and I'm freaking out. Girl, me too. (laughs) There is a lot of fear that I have around uh, labor and delivery. However, I want to share some things that really, really helped me. So when I honestly labor and delivery was one of my biggest reasons I didn't want to get pregnant. I was scared to get pregnant. I've like seen the movies. I see what happens during delivery. It looks terrifying. It looks absolutely horrible. We've all heard horror stories. And that was the narrative that I had in my head. Well, once I actually became pregnant, knowing that in nine months from now, like that's what I'm going to have to do. And and that's, there's, there's no turning back now. You know, it's like this, that's the only way it's going to happen. Um, I, I really wanted to do a lot of work around that. And so there were a couple books and a couple Instagram pages and stuff that really helped me start to shift what that narrative was. I was telling myself about labor and delivery and what my body is capable of. So first and foremost, when I first got pregnant, I was just really blown away by the the insane changes that were happening in my body. And it gave me this newfound like love and respect of what my body was capable of. And I've let that philosophy start to blend into the thoughts about how my body is going to handle labor and delivery. Like the way that the hormones ebb and flow and the way that our body just like knows how to like shift and move to support and nourish this unborn child and like that our body like can stretch into all these different like shapes I mean it's incredible or like that we grow a placenta like an entire organ that didn't exist until we got pregnant. Like our body does the most incredible things during pregnancy and delivery is the exact same. Our bodies know what to do. Like our bodies were made for this. Our bodies, our babies were made to be born through our bodies. And we don't give ourselves, in my opinion, 
the narrative that you usually hear about delivery like doesn't focus on that. They focus on the pain and the screaming and how terrible it is and how hard it is and all these things. But when you really take a step back and look at how incredible our bodies are growing this baby on its own, it's like delivery is the same thing. And so I kind of set myself on a mission to like brainwash myself positively when it came to labor and delivery. So a couple books that I highly, highly recommend. One of them is uh, Mindful Birthing. And this is a book all about being very present in the moment, breathing and using breath and mindfulness techniques to stay very, very present with what's happening. And how, you know, when we allow fear into the situation, it's only going to make it worse. But when we can stay in this present, relaxed, in um, mindful state, we are going to have such a better experience. So that book has been absolutely incredible. Another one that I really love is Ina May's Guide to Childbirth. So Ina May is like a super famous midwife. She runs a facility, um, like a birthing center, I believe in Tennessee. And she shares a ton. So the book is all about positive birth stories, as well as natural techniques for giving birth. So she is kind of like anti- hospital, you know, she's much more of like the birthing center, natural, unmedicated births, um, and that sort of thing. So it's definitely, you know, you'll definitely feel those tones when you read it. I am giving birth in a hospital. That's my plan. And that's what I feel at this time most comfortable with. Um, but what I like about that book is that it's all about empowering yourself and trusting yourself and knowing that your body knows exactly what to do. And if you give your body the space to allow labor and delivery and the baby to do its thing and come out, you know, you're doing the best you can. Like your body will work with you. But a lot of time there's all that fear and that stress and that nervousness and we tense up and we hold in tight and we like resist it. And so that book taught a ton of really, really good techniques about relaxing and letting go and allowing the process to unfold naturally, um, which I thought was really beautiful. And that really, really helped me feel more confident in myself going into labor and delivery. Now, asterisk, I've never done this before. So I'm I'm definitely coming from this naive place of like only reading about it. Um, I will probably do some sort of follow-up <laughs> podcast once the baby is here where I can share how everything went down and kind of, you know, hey, what are my thoughts like right in this moment now compared to like after going through it myself in, in real life? Um, because it's easy for me to sit here and be like, oh yeah, just relax during the contractions. That's my plan. And it is my plan, but I've also never felt real labor contractions before. So I do understand that as well. But those were two books that I really, really loved that really helped empower me and trust in my own body and my capability to give birth. Um, the other thing that I started doing <laughs> was I started watching home birth videos. Um, and there were some on Instagram that I followed. Um, I'll have to look up what the page names are, but there's a few like pain free birth is one that I follow. There's the naked doula is another one I follow. Um, oh shoot. And I can't remember the one that has a lot of like, they're very graphic, um, deliveries. Like if they're just straight up delivery, you know, you see everything that goes down, but they're so beautiful. They're so powerful. And to me, it gave me this like different perspective on delivery and what the human body is capable of. That's not what you see in like the Hollywood movies. And I liked that. Like that gave me the confidence <laughs> that again, my body is made for this and it doesn't need to be this horrifying thing. I also talked to, I've been, you know, anyone who's willing to share their birth story with me, like I just am soaking them all in. I'm hearing all of the different stories and all of the different things that happen because, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when I share like my birth plan and like what my ideal birth would look like. Um, but 
there's just so many things that can happen. And a lot of these things are outside of your control. So there's just, and that goes back to like that mindful birthing book and why I find that so helpful is just allowing yourself to be present with whatever's happening, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether what it's planned, whether it's what you didn't plan. Um, So if you're feeling very nervous or anxious or scared of that process, I mean, you are not alone. It's a very scary thing and it can be, but start doing some research on your own and start doing some of this like I say, positive brainwashing where you're just filling your mind and you're giving that conditioned mind like the proof it needs to see that you are very capable of doing this and your body was made for this and you have what it takes. And it's going to be an intense experience, but it's going to be a beautiful experience. Like I can't watch those birthing videos without crying every single time. I was crying earlier this morning (laughs) uh, before I recorded this because I watched a home birth and it was just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So they definitely hit differently when you're pregnant for sure. All right. So this isn't a question, but it's more of just a general topic. And they just said postnatal depression. And so again, this is a very common thing and it's something that I want to make sure that I'm very honest and transparent about if I do end up going through that. Um, It's, I think, a lot more common than we realize. And I think, I will say, I feel like people are becoming more open and more accepting of having this conversation, which I love to see, but it's still very scary to talk about. And I remember even in my prenatal yoga teacher training, a couple girls were like, yeah, I had it really bad and I I don't want to talk about it. Like they just don't even want to go there. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that I think happens to everyone in one way or another, but kind of on a spectrum. And again, preface by saying like, I'm not an expert in this category at all. I've done a little bit of reading about it and I know what some of the like warning signs are, like the symptoms are. And I think the biggest thing that I want to stress here, and this is like also advice to myself, is like when I feel or if I feel that postnatal depression, when I feel like I'm not myself or I'm having really negative thoughts or I'm feeling like just really, really bad, to know that it's okay. That doesn't speak to me as a mother. That doesn't speak to me as a person. It's just simply a crazy hormone blend that's just happening in our bodies and it happens to a lot of people and it doesn't mean that you're a failure. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to feel guilty about. But again, that can be easier said than done, especially when you are feeling down in the dumps and you're sleep deprived and you're just not feeling yourself. And like you're, you know, you're taking care of this little baby and you're like nursing all the time and you're like all the things. So it's one of those things that I have talked to my husband about just to make sure that Jake knows kind of like, hey, these are things to be mindful of and this is a very common thing that happens. So please know this. And like, if I come to you about this, like, please take it seriously. And he does. But it's also something that I know that if I'm feeling that way, I can always go to like, I have, I know who to go to when those things, those signs or symptoms start to show themselves to get help. There's nothing wrong with getting help. You don't have to push through this and figure it out on your own. You've got enough on your plate. (laughs) So that's kind of my take on postnatal depression. How do you have trust that everything is going to be okay? Not worrying all the time because of food and activities. So how do you have the trust that everything is going to be okay? That is very much a practice. I will say that throughout pregnancy, I have I have had this new sense of calm and trust in my body and in this process. I've given myself a lot of freedom and a lot of permission to chill, to relax, to listen to my body and trust myself. So like I talked a ton about this in the previous episode, like part one, but when my body feels this need to rest, I rest. When I feel a burst of energy and I want to move, I was allowing myself to move. When I was having pain and discomfort in my pelvis, like I didn't force myself to keep going and doing things. I gave myself that permission to like pause and rest and it, and it made a world of a difference. Um, 
And so the same goes for some of these worries. Like I try, if this goes back to that mindful birthing book, even if you take the birthing side of it, like being so present in each moment has been so helpful for me and just trusting, like I will know what to do when the time comes. I don't, I'm not letting myself get too far ahead and try to like figure out steps eight, nine, and 10, because I'm not there yet. I'm still at steps one, two, and three. I'm not letting myself get a, get too far ahead. I'm doing the very best I can in this very moment with the information and the knowledge that I have. And knowing that gives me that trust in myself that everything's going to play out the way that it needs to and surrendering to that. So again, it doesn't mean that I don't have worries. It doesn't mean that I don't have fears, but I'm also practicing And again, like I say, this is definitely a practice. I'm practicing staying present in this moment and not letting myself get too far ahead. So like one thing is like I have some friends and family that'll get like, well, what are you going to do about this when the baby's born? What are you going to do about this when the baby's born? What are you going to do about this? And I just keep telling them over and over, I'll figure that out when I get there. Right now I'm focused on things going on in this moment. Right now I'm focused on things going on now. I will figure those things out when the time comes because there's a million things that you can be thinking about. Like having a baby doesn't happen overnight. It's like you have this baby and like you're responsible for this baby for 18 years. So I don't need to figure things out years, you know, three, five, 10, 15, like I'll figure that stuff out then. Right now I need to focus on what's the best way to take care of myself and my baby while I'm still pregnant. Once the baby's here, what's the best way and how do I take care of a newborn and how do I do my very best as a mom, you know, again, and, and keep, keep evolving, keep growing, keep learning, but staying in the present moment and not getting too far ahead. So that has really helped me ease worries about things because there's a million things that could happen, but worrying about any of them doesn't do us any good. It's not going to make anything better. In fact, it's going to just like sabotage us. Like stress is terrible for our bodies and it's terrible for us while we're pregnant. So if you can do your very best to stay present, read mindful birthing, practice those techniques, practice meditation, you'll be able to let go of some of that stress and pressure you're putting on yourself to figure things out that you're not currently needing to figure out, if that makes sense. Um, And then not worrying all the time because of food and activities. Again, I talked a lot about this in the part one about movement and kind of the fear around that as well as like diet stuff um, where my situation is also a little bit different. Having the gestational diabetes, I had to quote unquote diet and track things way more strictly than I would recommend, but I had to do it and I wanted to do it because of that condition. So again, I think that just like a little to kind of sum up what I said in the other one, a lot of it comes down to being in tune with your body, listening to your body. So if something doesn't feel good, please do not push it. Do not try to like keep up with what you were doing before just because you were doing it before, but instead realize like your body's going through so many changes that you need to just roll day by day, realizing like every day is going to be a little bit different and that's okay. Um, And then with food, you know, instead of thinking of this like, like restrictive or scarcity diet, instead thinking about how can I nourish my body? You know, what, how can I fuel my body to be the healthiest and strongest it can be and really nourish my baby? That's what I would focus on instead of like restrictions. And again, prior to having diabetes or being aware that I had diabetes, like I was having treats, like I was having some junk food. I'm not going to sit here and be like, yeah, I ate so healthy the entire time. You know, I tried to, I definitely tried to add in more fruits and veggies and whole foods, like I always do, you know, that's not anything different. Um, but I definitely am not against like having a treat or giving into some of your pregnancy cravings. Um, but then diabetes had to (laughs) definitely cut back on a lot of like sweets and junk food and just carbs in general because of, um, my blood sugar levels. All right, let's talk about my birth plan and delivery. 
So I have one question. The question is, are you going to get an epidural? I'm 28 weeks and I'm scared of delivery. And yes, I feel you. It's definitely like a scary thing for sure. But here's my plan. So if I've learned anything about having a birth plan is that anything can happen. So no matter what plan you put in place, there's a very good chance that it's going to go totally different. So I am trying very hard to keep an open mind to whatever needs to happen will happen, to also educating myself on the potential things that could happen. And so if you read that Ina May's Guide to Childbirth, you'll learn a lot about the different ways that a delivery can be, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? baby brain is also a very real thing. So um, interventions is what I'm thinking of. So they'll talk a lot about the different kind of medical interventions that could happen. um, And that educated me a lot to just have a better understanding so I could have these conversations with my doctors. Um, So I don't have a very strict birth plan because like I said, I feel like that's just a good way for me to get really attached to a certain outcome that may or may not happen or may or may not work depending on anything that happens throughout delivery. Um, But with that being said, I also have an idea of how I would like things to play out. So a little background too. I So having diabetes, I've been seeing two different sets of doctors. I see my diabetes doctors and I see my normal OB, who I love don't love the diabetes doctors as much. They are very scary. I feel like they use a lot of fear tactics, which Ina Mae talks all about. <laughs> and and I feel like they are a little too conservative. Like they just want to medically get this baby out to ensure a safe delivery, which obviously having a safe delivery is my number one priority as well. Um obviously. <laughs> like I, I always think it's funny when people say that, like, well, what's most important is that you have a healthy baby. It's like, yeah, for of course it is. Like, are you, yeah. <laughs> but they, because I had the diabetes, they told me at my very first appointment with them. So before anything has happened, before I was able to either manage or not manage my diabetes throughout the pregnancy, they said, we're going to induce you early. Um, that's the plan. 38 weeks, 39 weeks. And I was like, wait a minute, um, why? Like, what's the point of that? And they, they didn't have a good reason why. Basically, because you have diabetes, it increases different risk complications. And that's, that's just what we do. So I didn't really love that. I kind of went back and forth with them a little bit. And I basically told that doctor like, Hey, you know, I don't really want to induce the pregnancy early if I don't have to. You know, ideally, I would really like labor to just start happening on its own naturally. And I was like, well, I'll talk to my OB about it. Had another appointment the very next day because all you do when you're pregnant is go to the doctor. I feel like, I swear to God, it's just like appointment after appointment after appointment. So the next day I went to my regular OB and I kind of shared, I was like, hey, they're really pushing for this. And, you know, I, I would kind of like to see how things play out. And she's like, absolutely, you know, let's take the data and the information that we learn over the next few weeks and see how things go. You know, how can you manage? Are you able to manage your blood glucose levels? Are you, what's the size of the baby? Because that's one of the biggest, um, one of the concerns of having gestational diabetes is that if your blood sugar is too high, that it feeds the baby too much and you have a really, really big baby and that can cause health complications for mom and baby. So if the baby's growing and getting too big too quickly, um, that's, you know, a concern. Blood pressure is a concern, not being able to manage your blood sugar levels concern. So legit, these are all very fair things. And that was my whole point take was like, hey, if these become problems, yes, we'll cross that bridge when it comes. If we need to induce early, we'll induce early. But what if they're not problems? If they're not problems, why can't we just see how things play out naturally? And she was like, I'm 
she's like, they can give us recommendations, but that's, I agree with you. Like, let's see how things play out. Let's see how everything goes for you. And so that's been sort of the battle for me (laughs) the last couple weeks is diabetes doctors really, really pushing for this delivery or early induction, even though everything is totally in range. Baby is in the 56th percentile. Um, so right on track size wise, blood sugar levels, very, very managed, um, and without medication, thankfully, even if they were though, there's nothing wrong with getting medication for this because you want to make sure that you're managing it as well as you can. And if your body, like that's the crazy thing about gestational diabetes is like, even if you do every single thing, right, if you eat healthy, if you are moving your body, you know, you're, you're doing all the things right. You can still not be able to manage it. Like it's just, it's, it's a hormonal thing from your placenta again, not a doctor, but like, it's, it's a hormonal thing from your placenta. So like even, it just depends on how many hormones are being, um, released. And if you're someone who it's like releasing a lot of these insulin blocking ones, like you might have to take insulin or take meds to fix that. And that's totally okay. But I haven't had to do that, and that's been totally fine. Um, And then blood pressure has been great. So, like, everything's looking really good, yet they keep pushing to induce early. And so I've had to put my foot down, which can be a very scary thing to do, to, like, say no to a doctor. It feels scary. It feels – I'm not, like, I'm not one of those, like, rebel people that are like, oh, yeah, I used to talk back to my teachers, and I talk – I don't care what the doctor says. Like, I know more than them. Like, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know more, but – I just feel like they weren't giving me a good reason for why we should induce early. And that was frustrating. So anyways, my OB was like, listen, they can give us suggestions, but ultimately we're making decisions. And ultimately you're the one making the decision because it's your delivery. It's your birth. So you can decide what we do. I'm like, okay, awesome. Like that makes me feel way better. And I'm not against it if there's a reason, but so far there hasn't been a reason. Um, So ideally... Again, I say this very loosely because I realize anything can happen. Ideally, um, I would go into labor naturally on my own. So there are some natural ways that you can induce. Um, You can have sex. You can go for walks. There's like different teas you can drink. You can drink castor oil. Again, these are like things I Googled on the internet. So I'm not saying like, go do all these things. Um, We are, so I'm almost at 39 weeks. I am planning on getting my cervix checked and getting my membrane sweeped. I think that's what they call it. And that's a natural way to start, potentially start um, labor if your body's ready. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But I have heard just through talking to friends that if it does work, usually you'll go into labor within about 48 hours Um, So that is kind of my first plan of like trying to naturally get labor, like coax labor to get started. Um, So my plan is that hopefully my body and baby will be ready to go into labor on our own in perfect timing without being induced with like actual drugs would be my first pick. And then (laughs) ideally I'll be in a safe place. I'll be home. I'll be able to labor at home for a period of time so that I can, you know, move freely and that I can like be as comfortable as possible. You know, I'll have Jake there with me. Um, My family lives kind of far away, so it's not really realistic to like have them be here. And with COVID rules and stuff, like only, I think we're allowed one, maybe two people to join us in the delivery room, but it's just going to be Jake and I, um, but labor at home for a little while. And then my plan is to go to the hospital once the contractions hit that point where they're like, yes, please come in. Uh, I forget exactly what that's, what that is, but I will have to just like look it up in the moment. Um, Google is an incredible resource. (laughs) And then, um, and then my plan is to just see how things go. So I don't necessarily see myself getting to the hospital and being like, give me an epidural ASAP unless I really feel like I need one. And there's a very good chance that I'll probably end up getting one. I'm a huge baby when it comes to pain. However, reading uh, the Ina May's book, watching these childbirth videos has also shown me 
how incredible and how our body will like release the hormones that need to be released to help deliver the baby. So I really want my body to do the natural work as much as possible. And again, not a doctor. I've read so many different articles and I have baby brains. So again, I'm not saying these things as if they are facts, but things I've heard is that, um, you know, when you, some people, when you get an epidural, it can slow down your delivery. Like it, it starts to slow the things down in your body and then you're not able to have the baby as quickly, which extending things or when things can get delayed, that can cause complications sometimes. But I also have another friend that got an epidural and she had her baby almost immediately because she like couldn't relax her body. But then when she got the epidural, she was able to, and then it happened really fast. So again, like everyone is so different and that's why I'm really trying not to be too attached or be like, oh yeah, this is a hundred percent what I'm going to do because I've never done it before. And in the moment I might want an epidural or maybe I won't want one and maybe I'm able to breathe through them. So like I'm also praying that I take after my mom because my mom had very smooth deliveries for both myself and my younger sister. Um, she was able to do it naturally. She said she her whole thing was she kept saying, I'm going to see how I go through this next contraction. If they get too hard, then I'll, you know, get an epidural. And so that's kind of my plan too. And then people are like, whenever I say that to people, they're like, well, be careful because that's, you know, sometimes you get too far along and then they can't give you one and then you're screwed. And I'm like, well, again, not a doctor, but I feel like when it's too late to give you one, that's because the baby's like almost there anyways. So in that case, it's like, yeah, you kind of are screwed in that sense, but you're also almost done. So like just freaking go with it. Um, and then my other thing is that I really want to, and this is like one of my reasons why I'm a little hesitant to get an epidural, Again, not, definitely not against the idea, but a little hesitant is because I've read that you get this natural urge to push. And when you feel that, like that is when you're supposed to be pushing. And a lot of times people will cue you to push too soon. And you really should wait till your body is telling you and giving you that sensation like push now. And so I'm a little nervous that if I have that epidural that I won't feel that sensation because I'll be numb. So... I might be pushing too early, which can lead to, you know, tears and all of that stuff, which again, sometimes that happens for people. Sometimes it doesn't, but overall, (laughs) that is what my plan is. So again, very loose. And again, who knows, like there can be different complications or different emergency reasons that pop up where I do need to be induced or I do need to have a C-section or I do need to have some sort of intervention that maybe I wasn't planning on. And again, in the moment, if there's an actual reason, I'm okay with that. I trust that. I trust my doctors very much. Um, And I will allow those things to happen for the safety of the baby, of course. However, what I don't want is to just do something for the sake of doing it. So that's sort of been my philosophy throughout. Um, And I feel like I know enough about the different things that could come up because I not only read the Bet Ina May book, um, Ina May's Guide to Childbirth, but I also took the birthing class that is offered at the hospital. It was like through Zoom because of COVID. And it sounds like from that class, a lot of my feelings and a lot of like the things that I want to be done are very in line with what my hospital and the team of doctors that I'm working with offer. So that makes me feel really good too, knowing that I'm pretty, I'm going to be in an aligned place where people really want what's best for mama and baby and are also opening to listening to your wishes as long as it's not harming the baby. So that is my delivery plan. I feel like it's kind of vague, but that's okay because who knows. And then on to this last bit. This last bit is about baby stuff. So how to figure out everything that's needed for the baby. Oh, is what I have to say to that. I... I'm like a wannabe minimalist. I'll start by saying that. I'm a wannabe I'm a wannabe minimalist. I'm absolutely not a minimalist. But 
I feel like there's just so many things you can buy for a baby. And I really, again, don't have one. I really don't feel like they're all necessary. Um, the major things that I've learned that we needed to get before the baby gets here is a car seat because they won't let you leave the hospital without one. Fair enough. Um, some sort of bassinet or crib that the baby can safely sleep in. Um, and then like diapers and baby clothes, like things that the baby can wear, blankets, burp cloths, that sort of thing. Those are really the major things I have found that you need. Now, there's a million things out there, and I'm not kidding when I say creating my like registry for the baby was – I spent hours, 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 hours researching different products, researching what's needed, researching what's not because – I just didn't know. I've never done this before, like I said. And it's like trying to figure out how to do something that you've never done. It's just really, really hard. And everything is so expensive. So there were some things that I would recommend um, you do that I found really helpful. So one was reaching out to mom friends and asking if I could either see their registry or just in general asking them like, hey, what do you recommend? Now, don't blast this to everyone. Pick a couple people because you will get an overwhelming, you're going to feel just as overwhelmed. Um, everyone's got a different opinion about things. And I will say too, again, especially if you're trying to kind of keep the cost down and whatnot, you don't want to overbuy things. You know, you can always you can always get things as needed and that's what I've told myself about a lot of it where I'm like I don't know if I'm really going to need this or not. So, I'm just going to wait. And if I decide that I need it, I'll send Jake to go get it from the store or I'll order it on Amazon or whatever. Like, we can get things so easily now that I just don't feel like it's necessary to like overbuy because I just think that can get really overwhelming too. Um, but it took a long time to research and find and put together a registry. And so I tried to keep mine as basic as possible. I tried to, you know, not get every single little gadget. So for example, one thing that I like originally did was, and this is just me too, again, everyone's different. So you've got to do what works for you. But for me, you know, we had enough space in our bedroom that I originally registered for a bassinet, a little changing pad upstairs, which when I say a little changing pad, they're like so expensive to get like a, a pad that goes on like a dresser top. Um, one of those, a bassinet and a pack and play. So I, I was registered for like all these different things. And then my mom was like, we just put you in the pack and play when you were a baby. Like when you slept in the room next to us, like we just put the pack and play in there. And I was like, oh really? And then another neighbor, mama friend of mine said the exact same thing. She was like, oh yeah, we didn't get all the different things. We just got a pack and play and used that to start. And I was like, sweet. Okay. So then I looked and I found they make like a combo thing. So I have a pack and play that is like the cute little pack and play that's also a bassinet and also has like a changing table, little attachment on it. It's perfect. So instead of getting all of these different things, I kind of got everything in one. And that worked really well because again, it like limits all the stuff we have, which I, tr again, want to be minimalist here. Um, but it also just saved us literally hundreds of dollars because each of those items was like one, $200. And the pack and play itself was like, I think 150 or 200 and it had everything in it. So yeah, it's like, I just feel like some of it is a little bit like, oh yeah, you need all these things. And it's like, do you really though? So I would recommend just talking to different friends and talking to, you know, maybe your parents or your in-laws or whatever, and just like see what people recommend because there's so many options out there. And it was really helpful for me to see other people's registries and kind of snag some items that I was like, oh yeah, that's a really good one and whatnot. Um, I registered through Babylist, which was a really cool website that 
Um, you create your registry on one place on BabyList, but you can get your things from all different stores. Bye Bye Baby, Target, Amazon, like all little baby boutiques, like all sorts of things. Um, so I thought that was really cool too and a really great tool to use if you're interested in creating um, an online registry like that. Um, how did you know that it was the moment to have a baby? What did you feel? Um, okay, so how did I know that it was the moment to have the baby? This is a really juicy question because, you know, Jake and I went back and forth quite a bit on this and kind of going back to like the fears we had around me, labor and delivery, um, fears about how it was going to affect just our everyday life and our business. Like we're just so used to living life on our terms. So the idea of like bringing in this new life and then having our world like revolve around them was scary. Like we're kind of selfish. Like, I don't know. I want to live my life and do my thing. And like, if I want to go to bed early, I want to go to bed early. And if I want to like read in bed quietly, I want to read in bed quietly. But it's like, we also, on the other hand, knew that we did want to start a family and that we did want to, you know, have babies eventually. And, you know, we're both in our thirties and, you know, you never know, are you going to be able to get pregnant? right away? Are you not going to? So it was one of those things that we we basically decided, you know, if we're going to try, now is probably the best time to, you know, like he's doing well with work. I am in an established business. You know, we've done quite a bit of traveling. Obviously the timing's a little weird with all the COVID stuff. Like that was kind of a concern, but we were both pretty optimistic that things were going to be figured out with that as well. Um, And yeah, so it was one of those things where we were like, no one's ever really ready for this. And if it's something that we do want, you know, now might be the best time. So it wasn't this like, for sure, like I definitely wasn't that person that was like, I can't wait to have kids, which I know a lot of people feel that way. That was absolutely not me. I knew I eventually wanted to. I was not like, Anti kids, like I was, I didn't feel like, oh, I never ever want to have kids. But as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I was all in. I was so excited. And it was just like, hell yes, we're doing this and it's going to be incredible. And that was just like an automatic instinct. Like it, I remember like seeing pregnant on that pregnancy test and being like, no way what? Like it was so shocking, but also so exciting at the same time. So I don't know. I definitely, it was, it's kind of hard to put into words because it was like, I just, there's never a right time. I know people say that all the time and it's like, you can always find excuses for why you shouldn't. On the other hand, I also want to say like, If you are one of those people that don't feel a desire to have children, which I have a few friends that feel that way, there's no pressure to do that either. Not everyone has to create children. Like that's not a necessity or a requirement for life. And it's such a life shift. Like that's what I'm continuing to wrap my brain around now is like my life is going to be so different. And again, different in a positive way. I'm really trying to aim and focus on that because there's going to be babies bring abundance. Um, So I feel like there's a lot of change happening and I'm still wrapping my brain around what that's going to look like. And I definitely still get kind of nervous when I think about that. Like, oh my gosh, well, what if I just want to go do this? It's like, okay, you can't just pack up your things and go like you used to, It's but it's going to be different. But then on the other hand, there's going to be so many new cool things that we're doing, incredible things with our baby that are going to just be so loving and heartwarming and incredible and beautiful. Um, So yeah, I feel like if you don't feel like you want to have kids, don't pressure yourself to do that. Absolutely not. If you feel like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I do desire this, but just like, is now the right time? Like, I don't know. You know, for me, there were a lot of things that were on like my life bucket list that I was able to get to 
um, before we started a family. And I loved that. You know, I started my business. That was a huge one for me. Like I said, Jake and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, you know, we, we moved into a house that we really, really love and can see ourselves raising a family here. Those were things that helped me feel like, you know what? I don't know if I'm hundred percent ready, but I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be. Um, but then on the other hand, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got the people that are like, I want to have kids right now. Go for it. You know, that's awesome. I love that. It's incredible. And I'm really excited to be on this journey, even though I was a little bit unsure in the very beginning. And that's actually our last question. Okay. So the last question that I had here is how did you know you were ready for children? I think I want kids, but I don't think I'm ready for them. Um, so just, I guess, adding on to that, that's not really a question. I kind of just talked about that, but yeah, I feel like, you know, if you feel like you're not ready, ask yourself, like, what, what is it? What are the things that I want to be doing that I maybe aren't doing or haven't done yet? And start making those a priority, you know, get those things in line, start doing those things and checking them off the list and, and know that again, that's no pressure to have kids. Maybe it's not something that you ever do. And that's totally fine too. Um, but if it's something that you, you know, you think you want, but you're feeling blocked, like you're not ready for them, honor that as well. I mean, that's why we're, so like I'm almost 32. Jake's a little bit older than I am. You know, we definitely, we've been married for several years. This isn't something that we rushed into and I wouldn't recommend anyone rushing into it. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing and I'm so excited for it and I feel as ready as I'll ever feel for this next chapter now. Um, but it didn't necessarily start that way and I think that's okay. But if you even would have asked me though a couple years ago, I, I wasn't ready a couple years ago for us to start trying to have a family. Um, again, personally, there were things that I wanted to do. My Starting my business was a huge one. I knew I wanted to start a business before... Um, I had a family and I'm so glad that I did because now I have a foundation that I can continue to build on as babies here. Um, but trying to get like all of that stuff up and running with a baby would be a lot harder. Um, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers that question, but I just want to thank you guys again so much for, listening to this episode for asking so many incredible questions. And I hope my answers made sense. Like I said, <laughs> baby brain is very much a thing. And it's funny because I feel like I am just kind of more scatterbrained and a little bit more rambly and <laughs> all the things, but you know, it's all good. It's all part of this journey. And, you know, overall I can say there being pregnant is not an easy thing. Um, there are good days, there are bad days, you know, there are days that I just feel like this pregnant queen. And then there are days that I just feel like a gross slob. There are days that I feel so confident in my body. And there are days that I just feel so uncomfortable and like, oh, everything aches. Everything is sore. I just can't get comfortable. Like the worst. So it's a roller coaster ride, you guys. And it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever gone through in the sense that I'm just blown away by the human body and I'm blown away by the obstacles that have come my way, the things I've had to overcome mentally and putting in that work and giving myself something to like practice with because that's the thing is like be grateful for the struggle, like look for the lesson in things because there is one. You just sometimes need to dig and find it and spend some time working through those things and not just like accepting them at face value. And all of that has just really helped me grow and prepare me for this new next chapter of becoming a mother that's going to have its whole bunch of challenges in itself and lessons in itself. And it's just like we're continuing to grow and evolve and learn and take it one day at a time. So if you're currently pregnant and you're listening to this, let this be a reminder that like you've got this mama, like you were made for this. It's not always easy, but it's totally worth it. And it's just such an incredible journey, not just creating this brand new life, but also learning and appreciating so much more about yourself. So 
Thank you guys again for asking incredible questions. I love you so freaking much. And thank you for listening to this pregnancy episode on Her Vibe is Pretty. We'll catch you next week. Bye.